Ah, back to basics. And I, I think our industry sometimes wants to run ahead. And without our basics, there is no innovation. There is no science. You might want to implement science and, and innovation into your work, but without our craft skills, we have nothing. Okay, so it's back to basics again. I've been shoeing the sport horse. Well, shoeing the sport horse is any athlete to me. Cutting horse, reining horse, I've shot those, successful ones. Jumpers, hunters, it doesn't matter. They're just athletes, okay? And they're shoeing appropriately for what that athlete's doing. Do clinics for horse owners and farriers. And my, what interests me is underperforming sport horses. That's my interest, is underperforming sport horses. Not when they're absolutely broke. It's when they start to underperform. It's looking at why they're under, underperforming, okay? And many people, you know, many owners will say, my horse isn't going like it used to. And as a farrier industry, and sometimes the veterinary industry, we tend to ne neglect that comment. Farriers, what are we? We're service providers. I'm gonna say, don't forget that, because that's what we are, number one, service providers. We're able to trim and apply shoes safely to the horse. Trim. Well, trim's whatever you want, but trim to me is trimming for the horse, trimming biomechanically, trimming appropriately. There's a huge amount to that trim, okay? It's not just removing, the, removing hoof. It's sometimes pre preserving hoof. And apply shoes safely. Well, it's correctly positioning the shoes. It's correctly selecting the shoes. It's being able to make shoes if you need to and modify shoes nearly every time you shoe a horse. There's not many horses that I shoe where there's not some sort of shoe modification, either a little bit of medial or lateral support or posterior support or break over. It's adding something, okay? And I don't think there's many horses I shoe that are absolutely perfectly conformed. So I'm always doing some shoe modification. Being aware of other shoeing styles and techniques you know, I mean, that's, I've been very fortunate to travel and I'm aware of other shoeing styles and techniques. Probably the biggest thing I've seen over the last 30 years is modern sport horse shoeing's evolved. Okay, we're losing a lot of the individualism of styles from like different countries and it's becoming more practical to shoe in the sport horse and the styles are, are becoming more the same. We need to be skilled in the application of modification of shoes, and we need to have a knowledge of pathological conditions. That's important. If you're gonna be shoeing horses for a long time, you're not gonna shoe perfect horses for your whole career. That's not gonna happen. Horses get older. There's not many 25-year-old guys in a, a, one of your football leagues that doesn't have some pathological changes. It's whether they affect them or not. But on Monday after they compete, or they play hard on the weekend, they probably do feel some aches and pains on Monday. They may not be 100% sound on Monday, okay? So it's being aware of pathological conditions. Communication, well, we're part of a team. Farrier, vet, rider, it's teamwork. It's listening to the others, okay? And I think that's okay. It's appropriate to listen to everybody's opinion. The rider rides that horse all the time. They're entitled to ask questions. They're entitled to give feedback. It's for us to read that feedback. You know, I don't know how many times when I was younger and oblivious that I, I know I had the comment, my horse isn't going like it used to. And I, I was oblivious to the comment. It's now for me, if somebody said that, like said that to me today, I, I, I panic because I, I, I had my eyes closed, you know? so. It's being very aware that we listen to the comments. That horse isn't going good on a diagonal. It's not, it's not engaging behind. It's starting to refuse into front fences. It's slowing down to go into corners. Any one of those com comments would make me s listen. Well, they, you know, stand up, listen, pay more attention. Two little lines that summarize everything I'm trying to accomplish. I'm trying to prevent injury and maximize performance. I don't think you can do much more than that. If you, do, if you accomplish those two things, I think you'd, you'd be pretty proactive in your shoeing. There's not much more you can do. So we're looking at preventing injury. Yeah, and they're all gonna get injuries. 
What we're, asked, we're offered to, in today's world is, I mean, title, is the animal suitable for the work? Well, often it's not. Somebody's got a standard bread and it's going to be a dressage horse. Somebody's got a thoroughbred off the track and it's going to be a jumper. Is it suitable for the work? No. Well, that's not our choice. We've got to make the best of it. We've got to shoe them appropriately. It's like that. There's more than one solution to that picture. One solution would be to take, let, take some of those boxes off. That's a pretty good solution. But the driver wouldn't be very happy. What he wants to do is throw a couple of riders on and balance it out. So there's more than one solution. And often when we're shoeing horses, they're not suitable for the work they're doing, but make the best of it. We can't complain. That's what our owner has purchased. Make the best of it. There's sometimes an expectation of indefinite soundness in our industry. And I'm afraid, like I said earlier, there's going to be days when our horses aren't 100%. You know, that 12 or 14-year-old dressage horse that's been pushed to a limit on a three-day show, at the end of that three-day show, is, is a bit of soreness something that you could take personally? No. You, as long as you can say, I've been proactive, I've done everything I can with the shoeing and trimming, some of them are going to just be sore after being pushed hard for, uh, for a three-day Grand Prix weekend. That's reality. So indefinite soundness is something that our pet industry seems to want. Okay, not our horsemen. Our horsemen are probably more realistic, but our industry is changing where quite a lot of our owners are really pet owners. We look there, navicular bones. We see two great big holes in the navicular bones. And if we think of some of the lamenesses that affect us most, affect us most, side bone, ring bone, degenerative joint disease, navicular, spavins, all the, if we get one of those lamenesses in a horse, it's pretty debilitating. There's no bringing that horse back from that type of navicular, okay? But there was a long process in getting to that, okay? That navicular bone at one point would have had some sort of irritation on it because it was normal at one point. Then it had an irritation. Then that irritation caused an inflammation. Then that inflammation caused bony changes, okay? But it didn't happen overnight. Same with spavins, same with ring bones, see with, same with side bone, degenerative joint disease. They, they're normal, and then they have stress, and they have inflammation. So along with that uh, irritation, it's quite likely there's going to be a change in gait, OK? A change in gait. Then as it becomes inflammation, there's going to be a bigger change in gait. That horse is probably going to become resistant. It doesn't go into the corners and power through. It's going to back off. So it's being aware when we're getting those pathological conditions. They don't happen overnight. You know, if you've been shoe, you know, shoeing a horse for a long time, not that some horses are just going to get navicular. That's it. That's reality. They have a weakness. They're going to get navicular. As long as you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, I've done everything I could along the way. I've been proactive. I prevented it for as long as I could. Shoeing profile. Type of sport. Well, we should be aware of what is involved in the sports that we're shooeing for. We should understand the sports. We should make an effort to do that. It's not just shoeing the horse and leaving. It's understanding the sport. Understanding what is expected of an eventer or a dressage horse or a cutting horse or a reining horse, okay? They're all sports. Being aware of the experience of the rider, that's going to make a, bi a big impact, okay? You can have a horse that's living in a barn and never loses a shoe. You've got width and length on it. And one thing changes. It stays with the same trainer. It stays in the same barn. And suddenly you've got a new rider and they, they're inexperienced. That horse starts losing shoes. What do you do? Well, telling them to ride better is going to be pretty ineffective and probably piss them off too. <laughs> okay, what you've got to do is change your shoeing. Okay, you may have to shorten up the shoeing. It may not be ideal, but you've got to take a decision. Either I'm going to shoe that horse and keep shoes on because the next guy is going to shoe that horse and keep shoes on or I'm going to lose the account. If you keep losing shoes, you're going to lose the account and you're not shoeing it properly if it's losing shoes, even though it's the rider's fault, an imbalanced rider. I used to get a lot of barrel races come when I lived in Texas. 
And you know, you come, they, they'd want a consultation and they'd bring this barrel horse four or five hours and they'd get it off the trailer. This guy would bring this barrel horse in and I'd look at it and think, oh, I couldn't have shot it any better. And then this young lady comes in, you know, and you think, okay, who's going to tell her, me or him? She needs to lose 50 pounds. Okay, you can't run barrels, you know, weighing 250 pounds. It doesn't work. It's an imbalanced rider. And the horse is going to either hit or pull shoes, and there's nothing we can do about it. So we can't fix every problem. Surface conditions, well, I come from a country with one type of surface condition typically, muddy and wet this time of year. I know some of you have probably got the same thing. And I, I would adapt my shoeing from summer to winter shoeing. Summer, I'd give it width and length, and in the winter, I'd shoe it shorter and tighter. You know, and I think that's appropriate. That's good horseshoeing. You know, because we, we cannot control everything. It's not possible. We can't control the environment. So if it's going to go out and lose a shoe twice a week, what's the point of putting them on? Okay? We need to shoe appropriately for the surface conditions. The confirmation and the age of the horse. You know, we need to be aware of those things. You know, are we being as proactive as we can with rocker toes and roll toes? You know, we see, we see all the research and we see all uh, the anecdotal stuff that in the majority of horses some breakover would help, okay, in front. And are we rolling toes or rockering toes or setting toes back? You have to ask this question yourself. Are you doing it? Or are you just taking the keg shoes and putting them on? Okay? Because a rocker toe or a roll toe or set back toe would probably be beneficial on most horses in front. Because as soon as they go lame, what do you do? Add a roll toe. Okay, or a rollover shoe. Trim, well, that doesn't change for me. You know, the only thing the trim will change is if I've got some horses working on really flinty ground, gravelly ground, rocky ground, I won't, I'll leave more, more sole in. I'll purposely not trim the sole. I can either trim it out and then put a pad on or leave a sole there. I'd prefer to leave a sole there. Shoe selection, something we all should be aware of. And you've got two choices with shoe selection. You can either fill your truck with loads and loads of different types and sizes of shoes, or you can have a more limited choice of shoes and know how to modify them. Okay? You can swell a heel to make an onion heel, or roll a toe, or double fuller it, or you know, extend the heels. So it's up to you whether you put more types of shoe in your truck, or you have more skills to sell. And for me, I prefer to sell skill and carry shoes in my truck. Shoe fit, well, we've covered that a lot. You know, that's appropriate to the horse, to the environment, to the rider. All those things are in that discussion. It's not just what's ideal for the horse. I've gone down that road, and I've gone back, and I, you know, at the end of the week, I've still got another 10 shoes to put on because I've lost too many shoes. So everything I thought should have had width and length, and it kicked me in the ass. So I am, pr I am practical. And nail selection. We've never had so much nail selection, and we do it. We do need it. Horses' feet are, have changed over the years. I'm seeing a lot finer-footed horses now than I did when I first started shoeing. So we got more choices of shoes, so we need to be picking a shoe, and a na uh, sorry, a nail for the shoe that has an appropriate head size so it keeps the, the shoe tight. And then we need to have an appropriate shank so not to cause too much wall displacement. But it's got to be strong enough to keep the shoe there. Okay, so nail selection is something that we should be aware of. And, uh, you know, I know there's probably about 900 types and sizes of nail now, and it does confuse me. Shoeing, dynamic, not static. Okay, and, and as farriers, most of our work is done static. The horse is tied up or it's stood on a surface, and that's it. You know, we do need to make the effort to see it, it at least walked out, trotted out on the type of surface that it's going to be working on. Because concrete will lie to you. Okay? We walk a horse out in a piece of concrete, and you will get a very, very different picture than you'll get with a horse on a piece of arena. It's just like taking a lady in stilettos. Walk her across the concrete, no problem. Walk her across a dressage arena, and it's not elegant. So we need to be aware that we should have a dynamic horse that's going to work on a surface. Okay? So it's a dynamic animal, and there's a whole series of different stresses in every stride, okay? You know, when that foot hits the ground, it's not just concussion, it's deceleration as well. There's a whole big stress there. 
After that, then you've got loading, and the, the, the leg loads from the heel of the foot first. Once it gets to center stride, that's maximum weight bearing. And you know that pretty little past an angle you see when you're shoeing the horse? It's not there at mid stride when the horse is trotting or galloping. That fet fetlock's heading to the ground. So, you know, when you're looking at that horse standing, for me, stationary, and I'm looking at that long pastent horse, okay, he's a long pastent horse, he stood still, his legs vertical, I don't mind if it's a fraction broken back, because all I gotta do is push his withers a little bit, change his weight bearing, and you'll see that fetlock fall into position. What's important is the leg is vertical, okay? That horse with a long pastern, what does it have? It has a stronger suspensory apparatus. So because that stronger suspensory apparatus, it may be lifting the fetlock just a little bit forward. But you just change the weight bearing, and you'll see it settle into position. So don't believe everything you see statically. The modern trim, what's that compared to the old-fashioned trim? You know, we've got to have a, decisive, a <laughs> divisive subject. And the modern trim, you know, everybody wants to have the Strasser trim. Anybody seen the um, traction trim? That was a cool one. I saw the traction trim, some barefooter in Germany, and you know, so I, I wanted the modern trim. And what's the difference with the modern trim? It's the same as the old-fashioned trim, except now we're more aware of how the horny structures relate to the sensitive structures. I think that's the biggest difference. We're relating the, the, the exterior structures of the hoof capsule to the internal structures. We need to know that we don't want too much toe, but we also don't want too much heel. Both are wrong. Too much is too much. So once we've trimmed the foot, what we're looking for is the end of the heels to be somewhere around the widest point of the frog. On some feet, you won't get them there. Okay, some of the, 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 the more thoroughbred feet, they may just be in front of it a little bit. But you've got to be careful on how far they migrate in front of the widest point of the frog. But if we draw a line across the heels, and then we draw a parallel line across the toe, then we can draw two perpendicular lines. And these perpendicular lines will show us where the widest point of the curve is. If we draw a center line, it'll show us symmetry, whether we have symmetry. It's nice to have symmetry. It's not always possible to get symmetry. It's try to move the foot in that L, try to manipulate the foot into symmetry. But what you can't make up with trimming, it may be useful to have this line down the center so when you position your shoe, you can position the shoe so you have symmetry. So what nature leaves out, you might put in with shoe position. Okay, a little bit. And we're talking maybe a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch of, of shoe sticking out not a quarter of an inch or a half inch of lateral extension. We're talking most times just a small amount. If we draw a line across the, the widest point, if we look at this foot, look at the distance from the center to the heel and the center to the toe. Well, we can see it's much more than 50% in the, the front half. That's okay, some feet you get, I like that. What it helps us to decide is where we're gonna position that shoe. We're so much into, and you see all this stuff, oh, are you going to use toe clips or side clips or quarter clips? For me, screw the clips. Don't even talk about clips. What we should be talking about is shoe position. Are you going to shoe the sh put that shoe to the perimeter? Are you going to set it halfway, half the wall thickness back? Are you going to set it to the white line? But it's looking at where you're setting that shoe. The clips are, you know, they're not important. They're irrelevant. Because I can take a shoe with side clips or quarter clips, and position it on that foot in exactly the same place that I put toe clips. I can give it a perimeter fit. So let's not confuse it with clips. Let's say what's important about anterior, posterior shoe position. And if we've got more than 50% in front, we may have to set the shoe back on a run out foot. And if you look on this one, to get it 50-50, we, we may have to set it back to the white line. That's okay but it probably won't need indefinitely fitting back to the white line, okay? And it's not like, oh, well, I've fitted it. What's the prescription now? This horse does well. We set it back to the white line. So we keep setting it back to the white line because as that foot normalizes, what we should be looking at is this distance and keeping the distance constant. So as that foot normalizes, in a couple of shoeings, we may be fitting the shoe to the midpoint of the wall, and after six months, we may be fitting it to the end of the hoof wall with a rolled toe but we're looking at proportion. 
And as the proportion of the foot changes, it's changing the position of the shoe relative to the white line and to the end of the hoof wall. If you set back a shoe on a foot that doesn't need it, you're going to cause hoof distortion. If you have a foot that is set back too long, too many times, that foot, you'll see those feet, their sole, the wall will flatten in front because it's bearing weight on two points at the, on the toe quarters. You'll see the wall flatten. You'll start to see distortion in the white line, probably a, 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 a crack in the toe. So just because it's good for a short time doesn't mean it's indefinite. It means every time you shoe a horse, it's making a choice. How much am I going to set that shoe back? Am I going to, am I going to set that shoe back? Have I got that foot to a point where a, a perimeter fit is good with a rocket toe? Okay, and there's no black and white. You have to make the decision when you shoe. It's looking at how the horny structures relate to the sensitive structures. We look at our center of articulation there. And we, I'm not going to give you, ever, you guys have had so much anatomy, but there's the center of the coffin joint. If we drop a vertical line, if we look at the foot from the center to the toe, we can see right now it's much larger than from the center to the end of the heel. Okay? And it's not because we've got excessive toe. Look at the, the thickness of the sole at the toe there. That toe is short enough. So the problem isn't the toe is too long, the heels are too long. And if you look at the buttress of the heel, can you see it grow down that white line, it, that area that's been shaded? It grows down at one angle, gets to this arrow here. Can you see it fold forward? That is a heel that is collapsing. It's remodeling. If we take away the collapsed area, can you see if we trimmed it from here back to there? Look how much we'd increase the second half of the base of the foot by taking away the excess heel. I didn't say to lower the heels. Because lowering seems to me to take below normal. For me, I'm going to take away the excess heel and move the heel back to normal. And then we would have, we'd much increase the surface area in the second half of the foot. It may still need the shoe setting back a little bit at the toe to, to fix the 50-50, the but it's important that we take away the excess heel. Because look at the other things that are being affected. Right now, this is the last point of weight bearing where that arrow is. So it doesn't matter how long you put that shoe on, when the concussion enters that foot, it's going to enter there. Look how small the area of the digital cushion is over that area. And what's missing in that picture? The wing of the coffin bone, isn't it? It looks like right now the coffin bone ends there. It doesn't. Look, there's the, wing of the, co there's the coffin bone, the back of the coffin joint, then there's the navicular bone. And you can see the wing of the coffin bone is actually sticking back just behind the navicular bone. So what we're saying is, somewhere here is going to be the wing of our coffin bone. So the concussion is entering quite close to the wing of our coffin bone. This big area of the digital cushion won't be functioning until we take away the excess heel. And then the concussion will enter here. So how we trim that foot on the exterior really relates to the interior. <coughs> now go back one. We've got time. We're not in a rush now, are we? Um, phase of stride. Well, we talked about it. We've got decelerate, impact and deceleration. High stresses. Okay. Then we've got weight bearing happening from here to here. Starting weight bearing, starting the heel until you've got full weight bearing at center stride. The moment you go past center stride, you're transferring the weight onto the toe. And it's be becoming mechanical. And it's also important to understand what mechanical on concrete is and mechanical on a soft surface is. Because the moment you transfer weight onto the toe on a soft surface, the toe's sinking in a little. If the toe sinks in, I don't know whether that's technically the heels raising and breakover starting. But different surfaces, different breakovers, that's why ground reaction forces are so important. If we've got more than 50% of the foot in the center of articulation, then we're going to have leverage. We're going to have action against the foot. It's just two x-rays, before and after, at a clinic. Okay? And this wasn't six weeks apart. This was an hour apart. The horse came into the clinic, heel sore. And if you look at it, draw a vertical line. Well, look how much is in front of the center of articulation to behind. So when that foot lands on the ground on a soft surface, what's going to happen? Heels are going to sink in a little. 
Will that tighten the deep flexor tendon? I think so. So now you get to break over, and you've got all this, le this leverage at break over. What's it going to do? It's going to cause a resistance at break over. It's going to cause another tightening of deep flexor tendon. Now if we look at the bottom of the coffin bone, can you see the wing of the coffin bone right there? That's the wing of the coffin bone. Look where the last point of weight bearing is. Right over the wing of the coffin bone. It wouldn't even matter if you fit that shoe back out here. That would be the last point of weight bearing. And the concussion was entering over the wing of the coffin bone and the navicular area. The other thing that was happening, look at the front, the joints here and here. They're getting pinched at the front of the joints. So there's a lot of things going on. But why is that horse heel sore? Well, the whole mechanics of the bottom of the foot is probably aggravating it. Okay. This is after shoeing. And I'm not one of those people. I went through the time where you could fix anything with a trim in one time, and I stripped feet, and I weakened feet. I believe you have to leave enough in hoof integrity when you trim that the horse is not foot, foot sore. And when I look at this, that foot trim didn't probably go wrong in one trimming. Why should I fix it in one trimming? Why can't I improve it? Why can't I make a 70% or an 80% improvement? And then get a little bit more next time and a little bit more the time after. So if we look at it right now, this x-ray got overlapped. But if you look at this rocker toe, can you see this rocker toe comes up to about here and that line intersects somewhere here? You can see that the distance from there to center and from center to the end of the heel is much improved. It didn't say it's fixed, it's improved. Might have to strip the hoof wall if I wanted to fix it, but I didn't want to strip the hoof wall. I wanted to leave the horse something to stand on. But if you look now, it's much closer to 50-50, isn't it? From there to there and there to the end of the heel. And actually, I stuck a bit of shoe on the end to give it a bit of posterior support. But I'm just looking at the physical foot part, much improved. If I look at the joints, I think the joints have improved. And if you draw a line at the last point of weight bearing, look where that, that arrow is now touching that shoe. Way behind the wing of the coffin bone and way behind the navicular bone. So concussion is going to function much better. So we improved it in every area. And I didn't say this horse went out sound from this clinic, but it went out 75% better just through shoeing. Okay? And so I do believe as farriers, we're one of the most important parts of the package for the owner. Okay? Good farriery, good trimming is really, really important. I know a lot of you guys are probably running into the barefoot thing now. Anybody? No? Nobody? Everybody. Well, I want to know, well, next time you meet a barefooter, ask them how they're going to give posterior support without a shoe. How they're going to give some medial or lateral support without a shoe. How they're going to protect their trim when that horse is wearing its foot unevenly. Because the first reason I shoe is to protect my trim. That's my first reason protect my trim because they're doing canter pirouettes and piaf passage or you've seen those videos of um scott's scott lampards where the horses are galloping around the corner those feet don't wear evenly so the trim is there to protect the shoe is there to protect my trim and so as farriers i think we're we're way underestimated right now hoof distortions things that we need to be aware of if we get any hoof distortion, we need to be aware of it. Hoof distortion is stress. Flares, underrun heels, prolapsed frog, prolapsed sole, distortion of the coronary band, white line, broken bars, quarter cracks. They're all distortions of the hoof capsule. And you can look at a simple example. If I take a pencil and I, I cut it, the, the razor, they're rubbers in England, but they're razors in America. I think it's polite, isn't it? Um, to cut, me, cut me rubber a perpendicular to the pencil and push it into the surface and we're going to get a nice even distortion. If we cut the eraser at an angle and we push it into a hard surface or a solid surface, after a while it's going to flare. It's going to become flat on the bottom and it's going to cause flares. When we look at a lot of feet that have hoof distortion, flares, and there's different types of flares. One is neglect and the other one's stress. And then there's two types of flare. There's one on the end of the toe, which is leverage-based. And then we have either medial or lateral flares that are weight-bearing-based. But if we have a flare on one side of the foot, 
is a flare an excess thickness of horn? This is something to think about. Is a flare an excess thickness of horn, or is it an excess length of horn? I think it's an excess length of horn. And I, one of the things, you know, you, you get a chance, get to re if you can dig it up, read what Don Birdsell from California wrote about hoof distortion. For me, that was one of the most enlightening things in my career. So we're going to control hoof distortion. Here's some pictures of how hoof distortion can happen at a heel. Okay? Again, a friend of mine, I, I, I'm a pilferer. Okay? Craig Jones from Australia did this. And this is like a plaster of Paris coffin bone. And around the edge of it, he put, put like, um, it was like a sheet of foam straws. Okay? And the, 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 the blue line represents about a, um, a, cough, a, a positive angle on P3 of about three degrees. So what we've got right now is really too much heel, haven't we? Because that's way more than three degrees. So look what happens if we put, have too much heel. Is that what happens to collapsed heels, underrun heels? They fold in and forward, don't they? I thought that was a, just a, a nice series of pictures. So we're, we're, lo we're looking at hoof distortion is something that we should be very, very aware of. I control hoof distortion. Now, hoof distortion happens for three reasons. Well, neglect. If horses aren't shod often enough, I don't care how well you shoe it today, if it doesn't get shod for 10 weeks, it's out of balance. Okay? Horses' feet grow out of balance. Anybody who goes back to horses in six weeks and think they're just as balanced as the day they left, I don't believe it. Okay? Feet grow out of balance. They grow forward, and they, they will distort depending on confirmation. But neglect is the first reason. Confirmation will cause feet to grow distorted. Okay? And even weight-bearing will cause hoof distortion. But if we've got hoof distortion because of, of poor conformation, then our job is to control it. And we can control it by, by manipulating the hoof capsule, and we can control it by shoe position. The last one we hate to talk about is farrier error. If there's anybody here that can stick their hand up and say they trim feet perfectly, I want to go outside and uh, see the trim. Because I used to think I trimmed very well. And now what I'm trying to do is minimize my mistakes. Because I'm working with my hands. And if you ever look, when you get finished, if you ever look back and find no faults in your work, it's because you didn't look. Okay? Because I used to think I was perfect. Now I know I'm not. Last subject in horseshoeing that's still missed, and I'm thinking about it and still thinking about it. We speak so much of confirmation. Everybody here know that word? Yes, confirmation. How many of us here use the word posture into our horseshoeing? What's wrong with the posture of the horse? It's a subject some people are aware of, but not the majority. Okay? Because there's a very, very big difference between base narrow confirmation and base narrow compensation. Many of the horses we see that are base narrow are not base narrow. They're comp compensating for inappropriate trim. Horses' legs behind vertical, in front of vertical, inside of vertical, and outside of vertical. They're all posture problems. And we're we should be aware of posture. If you go to a rider, and you can see that person there, he has two very different postures, doesn't he? What, what happens when, you're riding, when you go to a riding stable, and we've probably all been riding stables, and we've seen someone sit on a horse, and we have a little giggle down the other end of the barn, and we know they can't ride. And we haven't seen them go anywhere yet, and we've already made the decision. They can't ride. Just like anybody played golf? Yeah, there's a few of you. Your golf pro goes, goes oh my God, you're going to slice the ball every time if you stand like that because of posture. And the riding instructor doesn't walk up to that person on the horse and say, for God's sake, lady, you've got shit confirmation. <laughs> they don't do that. They go, they say, would you please mind sitting up straight? Would you please put your shoulders back? Would you, you know? They improve posture. And as a horseshoeing industry, a lot of time we forget about posture totally. And we're so tied up with everything else. 
And we do need to be coming more aware that we can affect posture. Posture will affect riding. You can anticipate from postures of the horse what riding problems. If you've got a horse that stood behind vertical, when that horse rides, it's probably going to ride hollow. It's probably going to be heavy in their hands. Okay? We can anticipate that from posture. Okay? It's a wonderful subject, and it's one way, I, uh, for me, I've made money. Because I go to a place and say to the rider, God, that thing, does it snap? You know, is it heavy in your hands? You know? What do you do? And put it in an artificial frame, and they go, yeah. Because that's what they're trying to do. That hollow back horse, they're trying to bring it into an artificial frame. It's not a real frame, because they're trying to compensate for poor posture. So I think that'll do. You guys got enough questions?